Great. So I think uh, there's been another reminder that has been sent out to the remaining people to join and uh, uh, we can get started anyway. So uh, guys, as an introduction, I am Trilok. I head the marketing here at Ekin, who is the co-founder and COO of Silver Oak Health. Uh, he's an experienced mindfulness pr uh, practitioner and also an HR professional uh, with around 20 years of work experience. And he would be the guide for us and the coordinator for the entire workshop. So welcome all of you again and uh, passing on the mic to Sarvana. Thank you, uh, Trilok, and uh, good evening, everyone. I remember five years ago when I, I quit my full-time job, or yeah, again, I'm still in a full-time job, but uh, you know, in a, in a, I was, I was in, a, in a nice, I would say a good job, right? And I, I co-founded Silver Oak Health. And, uh, and a few months later, my, my father was diagnosed with cancer and, and with probably eight months of time left for him. So on one hand, I was trying to come in terms with my father's illness. On the other hand, my mortgage payment was looming over me with no income in hand, right? Um, and it start affected my my sleep, um, uh, increased levels of anxiety, stress levels going up, right? You could you could think about all these possible issues what uh, one could experience, right? So so today I'm going to you know in the next 45 to 50 minutes I'm going to be sharing some of the same tools. And strategies with you what I adopted five years back right to bring my mental health my emotional well-being on track right so so mindfulness is one of the major component I started using five six years back and and it has made uh, so much difference in my life and, and and that's exactly what I'm going to be sharing uh, with all of you as part of this uh, session right so again welcome uh, everybody and let me see how do I manage it. Okay. all right Okay, so I want to talk about, you know, why invest in mindfulness, right? Uh, as an HR professionals here, you know, I want to ask this question, right? And of course, you, you see a lot of answers out there, right? Uh, <clears throat> there are several studies done, right? Uh, and I'll talk about mindfulness a little more in detail later. Today, there are several studies done. Uh, it's a scientifically proven process. It is evidence-based. What do you want to call it? Whether it's a tool, whether it's a strategy, whether it's a practice, what do we call it? You know, it's, it's a scientifically proven. So there's a lot of data around uh, to prove that if you practice mindfulness, these are some of the outcomes you could expect. So and we'll talk about what are some of the outcomes as well, right? But typically in an organization level, what a lot of companies have experienced is people who have incorporated mindfulness in the long run have experienced some of these benefits in terms of, you know, uh, reducing absenteeism or, or cutting down turnover, reducing healthcare costs, uh, especially, you know, these are very common in the in the Western countries where the healthcare cost is very high, right? So, so they, they have obviously seen some of these uh, returns, increase in employee productivity, you know, improved job satisfaction. These are some of the, you know, relationship ch you know changes. All of this, some good benefits what people see. And that is one of the reasons why today a uh, lot of companies have come forward and, and started investing in mindfulness, creating a practice around mindfulness in the organization. But some, some large companies like say an ENY or an SAP or a, or a Google, they have people in the roles of chief mindful officer, right? So they are in charge for this whole program, right? So that's a level of, you know, commitment and investment some of these large companies are making, right? So, so that's why you want to invest in mindfulness. On the other hand, let's talk about what is happening on, on from a from an issue standpoint as you know if you want to call it as a stress or what do we want to call it what is happening out there right so i want to quote a study back in 2016 or 17 you know uh, more than two lakh employees across 30 large organizations in india was conducted and then almost half of them came back and said they were going through some kind of stress whether it is anxiety or depression they were going through some kind of stress so that is what they reported so it's a it's an issue and the numbers are only going up as we speak and of course uh, in the last three months, uh, the numbers have actually, you know, become a lot more higher, right? And of course, you know, I also want to talk about what is the impact of stress at workplace today, right? So this is a study from SHRM, Society of Human Resource Management. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that, right? They conducted the study again, uh, I think it was again 2017 or something, and then looked at 
three industries finance and banking it its travel and hospitality and they and they wanted to understand what is that the companies are losing from their bottom line every year because of stress and that's reason the study was called a stress score right so if you look at an average of 5000 employees in the finance and banking industries they're losing almost 100 crores 105 crores every year and similarly in the it its approximately 10000 employees 50 crores and, and in the travel and hospitality 2000 employees 10 crores so this is the money each company is losing every year because of the productivity challenge there are two aspects they used in this particular study one is of course the absenteeism like people taking constant leave because of undergoing stress and then presenteeism right which basically means you're physically present in the office but then mentally absent Right. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this and, and those are the two parameters which were used to conduct the study. So they, they had, you know, uh, 2,157 uh, survey responses and 12 interviews with CHROs in various organizations. So it's a, it's a, it's a long study and, and it, it, this is the data, this is the outcome of this particular study. So again, this is a huge eye opener for a lot of us when we see for the first time, oh my God, you know, this is what we are, we are not paying attention today, right? So this is something all of us need to know as HR professionals. It's very important to understand, right? And, and next, you know, it's, it's, we are going through unprecedented and tough times. I'm sure all of you are aware, and I'm sure the challenges have, have probably uh, increased or multifolded for all the HR professionals, right? I can completely understand. And, and, and dealing with the pandemic is, is not easy, right? There are so many different challenges. And I'm, I'm sure if you are feeling on the edge, and, and, and let me assure you, you're not alone here. We're all here together, right? And, and fear is probably the most uh, deadliest virus today. And of course, thanks to all the news channels and social media, you know, they're all making sure they're building a sense of anxiety among all of us, building the uncertainty as well, right? So, so while talking about uncertainty, I want to refer to our brain, right? Our brain in particular does not like uncertainty, right? In fact, one of the core functions of human brain is to make sense and meaning out of every data we process on a daily basis, right? Using our five senses. And what are those five senses? The ability to see, hear, smell, taste, and touch, right? So these are the five senses. For example, today, I'm sure we are all using our, you know, hearing and seeing sense and, and making sense out of this webinar, right? So, so those five is what we use on a regular basis, right? So the moment our, our, brain is confronted with uncertainty and is not able to make sense out of it it evokes a lot of difficult emotions such as fear anxiety frustration anger right the list goes on so so in the last three four months i'm sure all of us have experienced this right a uncertainty three b not able to make sense out of it and of course it evokes a lot of difficult emotions we have gone through all the fear and anxiety and worry and anger and frustration whatnot right so it's absolutely common for all of us, right? Or it's absolutely for our employees to go through this. So only thing we can assure is, remember, you're not alone. We are all here together, right? So that's the most important aspect we need to understand when we talk about uncertainty and pandemic, right? Next, you know, while we are talking about this topic and we're talking about brain, I want to little bit talk about, you know, what happens inside our brain when we actually undergo stress, right? So there are two areas I want to talk about. One is called prefrontal cortex, right? So prefrontal cortex is the newest part of human being's brain, which is which was developed as part of the evolution, right? And 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 prefrontal cortex is responsible for functions like focus, concentration, creativity, higher order thinking, decision making, your your mental clarity, creativity, memory. All of that happens through prefrontal cortex, right? Amygdala on the other side is responsible for your emotions the emotions what we talked about right we said your your uh, fear or anxiety or worry or sadness or happiness or anger whatever you know you you go through all of that is controlled by amygdala so when we go through a stressful situation and, and I, I would request all the, the participants to just recall a recent stressful situation i want and want you to connect with me and, and 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 kind of tell yourself yes this is exactly what happened with me as well right so so what happens is the moment we are confronted or we are going through a stressful situation a couple of things happens inside our brain one is our prefrontal cortex shuts down right and by the way it is also referred as the chief executive center of the brain right because of the all the important functions it does it's like almost like a ceo of a company right 
unfortunately it shuts down by 70% or 80% when we are undergoing stress so the ability to make decisions ability to be focused ability to concentrate ability to have mental clarity all of that is out of the window right what are we left with we are left with amygdala which is 100% active even in a stressful situation right and no surprise we all tend to become very emotional when we are in a stressful situation and that's exactly what i wanted to do recall in a recent stressful situation did you become emotional i'm sure most of the time the answer is yes and this is why we become emotional the moment our our prefrontal cortex stops working the analytical part the reasoning part the logical part of the brain is not functioning so we'll talk about how mindfulness as a practice can help you keep your prefrontal cortex active even in a stressful time right so that is something we're going to talk about later in the webcast right so next <clears throat> i'm i'm going to do a, a small exercise right and and for this exercise i i want you know uh, again the screen says it let's count so i'm going to have all of you count but i'm going to talk about what do you count right how do you count so that's what i'm going to talk about here and 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 i'm when i say start i want you to start this exercise so till such time i want to give you some instructions right so a we are going to count our thoughts right how many thoughts we are going to have in maybe 30 seconds right so we'll we'll do that one two right so there is there is no reason for you to push yourself to say no, no i don't want to you know get any thoughts or i want to you know get more thoughts so you don't have to do anything because thoughts will come and go automatically that's what minds do minds job is to produce thoughts right so we don't have to do anything right and 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 if you try and push not have thoughts it will actually get more thoughts right for example if i tell you uh, uh, do not think about a pink color elephant right that's exactly what you'll be think that's exactly what your mind will paint a picture nice picture of a pink color elephant in front of you right i'm sure none of us have seen a pink color elephant none of us are going to see a pink color elephant in our lives but what mind is mind can do is actually paint the picture and bring it to you and that's what minds do most of the time it brings a pictorial image in front of us when will be a thing right so so let's just go with the flow and and just count and label them so so the way i want you to do is when i say start any thought which comes to you just label them one and the next thought comes label as two and you'll also realize that you know there are one thought or thought there is no correlation right we call it as monkey mind it keeps jumping from one branch to other branch with no correlation right so you notice that also so it's absolutely fine right so this is how our minds work and and i want just you to pay attention to your thoughts nothing else at this point of time for the next 30 seconds while we go through this exercise all right so i'll be ready let's get started the 30 seconds starts now right as i said uh, just keep labeling the thoughts with number and i'm not not going to ask any of you what thoughts you had that's a dangerous question to ask so So we're only going to talk about numbers here. I want the Ekin Care folks also to participate here. All right, time up. Um, all right, so that's the exercise. So we're going to do a quick poll here. Um, you know, I want all of you to go to menti.com, m-e-n-t-i.com, and you can use the code. Two three nine five double nine, and you will see the poll questions where you can select uh, based on the number of thoughts you got, five or less, or six to ten, or eleven and above, right? So that's what we are going to uh, quickly do this year. I'll give it a minute here for all of us to finish it. All right, we got seven. Uh, maybe we'll wait for a few more seconds. All 
All right. So as you see, the, this is a live uh, poll we are doing here. Uh, so as you enter, the poll keeps changing. So you got almost nine entries. So uh, majority of them are five or less. Uh, in fact, five or less or 11 and above almost equal at this point of time. So this is just to give you an idea of number of thoughts we could get in a 30 second period, right? So, so here we were intentionally paying attention to our thoughts. Generally what happens is, you know, we are running in an autopilot mode. Most of the time we are not even paying attention to our thoughts unless it's an important thought, right? It is going to be very important to you. You have to make a decision based on that. You're going to pay attention. Otherwise, right, uh, you're not going to, right? So, so that's what happens in most of the time. So, so you might wonder, you know, looking at the number of thoughts, oh my God, you know, how much thoughts could I have in a day, right? Uh, and, and, and that's probably, you know, very, very close to, you know, what we are going to see here, right? In terms of, you know, number of thoughts we could possibly have. So as per the National Science Foundation, our thoughts range anywhere between 15,000 to 70,000 thoughts, right? And there are several studies which kind of say that 50 to 60,000 thoughts are probably the average, but then the, the range is 15,000 to 70,000 thoughts. And, and the thoughts probably also matter depending on the mood, right? How we are, you know, how emotionally balanced we are on a particular day. If I'm very, uh, a lot of anxiety or I'm depressed, obviously my thoughts are going to be a lot more than a neutral day, right? So, so that's the reason you have a range of thoughts, you know, and, and, and what interesting is 98% of our thoughts are repetitive. And 85% of our thoughts are negative or 80% of our thoughts are negative. It's a huge number. I know that between 80 and 85, right? So primarily our thoughts are working against us, right? It's very important to understand, right? And then on the right on the screen, you see half of our life we spent in thoughts. And, and when we talk about thoughts, where are we? Either in the future or in the past, right? You can't be in the present moment and thinking. When you're thinking, you're thinking about the future or you are thinking about something happened in the past, right? So that's why I'm saying half of our life, you're not even present, right? And in fact, the way I see it, we are probably living three different lives. We are living in the future, in the past, sometime in the present. And no wonder it's so taxing and so hard on us and it's so exhausting in other day, right? So that's the little bit of statistics on thoughts, right? So when we talk about thoughts, it's very important to understand. As I said, thought is a very powerful tool, right? You, you could see what just, you know, it could do in terms of painting a picture in front of you, right? So thoughts, you know, if you could manage, it's, it's beautiful. If not, it becomes very hard, right? And of course, it's very difficult to turn off when you don't need it. Right? Unfortunately, we don't have an Alexa to say, Alexa, turn my thoughts off today. Right? And I, and I don't think it's ever going to happen. Right? As long as you're alive, your mind will produce thoughts. Right? And as I said, it disconnects from the present moment, which is almost 50%, half of our life. Right? And finally, are thoughts facts? No. Thoughts are mere thoughts. The moment we start believing in our thoughts, that's a slippery slope, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, right? So that's where the problem starts, right? So thoughts are mere thoughts. If I get a thought that, you know, oh, the presentation didn't go well, you know, uh, whatever, right? That is a thought. It's not like I am, I'm really bad at it or whatever. It's not about me. It's, it's about thought, what I feel. Maybe, maybe the presentation is going well. Right? But I could get a thought that things are not going well, right? So it's just a thought, right? So as I said earlier, the difference between future and past is understanding the difference between what if and only if, right? In fact, the way I see is, you know, anxiety and depression are, are, are probably the future and the past here, right? Because anxiety, right, is always about the future. It's about the unknown, right? In terms of what if. What if this happens? What if I lose my job? What if I stop getting my salary? What if I, you know, get the virus? All these questions about the future, the unknown, right? On the other hand, depression is always about the past. Something which has already happened, something very unpleasant. I'm not able to come in terms with it. I'm just brooding over it. We call it as only if. Only if this did not happen to me. Only if this person did not do this to me or, you know, whatever it is. Right? 
So that's the difference between understand the difference between the future and the past, right? Anxiety and depression, very important, you know, which keeps us away from the present moment, right? Next, I'm going to do a small exercise here, and I'm going to give you an understanding of how does it feel to experience mindfulness, okay? So, so before I start, I'm, I'm going to give you some instruction on, you know, how to do this, right? So one, I'm sure all of you are sitting on a, on a chair comfortably. So I want you to just pull yourself a little bit in the front of the chair, right? So that your back is not resting on the back of the chair, right? And I want to make sure your back is straight, your chin is parallel to the ground, and both the feet on the ground. And I want you to, you know, place your arms comfortably either on the armrest of the chair or somewhere on your thighs, right? So that's the posture I want you to get in. And once you get into that posture, I want you to gently close your eyes and make sure your, your, your facial muscles are relaxed, your shoulders is relaxed, right? And once you're all set in this posture, I want you to start paying attention to your breath. Just pay attention to your breath as you inhale and exhale. Continue to pay attention to your breath. And how does your air feel when it enters your nostrils? Does it feel warm? Similarly, when you exhale, does it feel cold or warm? What do you experience? And, and where are you experiencing this breath? Is it in your chest, lower abdomen? Where are you experiencing? You don't have to alter your breathing style. Just breathe normally. Breathe in and breathe out through your nose and just observe as it enters and exhales your nostrils. And while you're doing so, you might be distracted. That could be a noise or there could be some other distraction or your mind could wander. It's absolutely fine. All you need to do is just observe whatever that distraction is, whatever the thought is, and just let it go and bring your attention back to your breath. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to react. You don't have to respond. Just bring your attention back to the breath. Another few more breaths. All right, when you're ready, I want you to gently open your eyes and bring your attention back to the screen. All right, so this is a, a little bit of experience, right? Um, so I also have a poll here, but then given the, the number of people are less, um, you know, let's probably have a, a conversation around it. So can somebody tell me what did the experience while you were actually going through this short practice? So. Sashi, maybe you can unmute uh, everyone and, and we could probably have a quick interaction here in terms of what is the experience. Is everybody unmuted? Yeah, they're all unmuted. So you guys can unmute yourself again. So the um, bulk unmute has been taken care of. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can hear you. All right. All right. Maybe maybe we'll move forward. You know, we'll we'll have a few more questions as we move forward. Okay. So that was the you know uh, so so the experience could be for. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, my my system got muted. So. Yeah, so I didn't hear uh, from anybody, but let's okay, that's okay, let's move forward. So some of the experience, what people would felt is, you know, uh, you know, an increased level of focus or or a calmness, right? So these are, you know, or being aware of what is happening. All of this is what we experience when we 
do mindfulness practice so so that is what you would apply you know experience so we could we could take this poll later also i'm just going to move to the next slide okay so these are you know some of the celebrities who practice mindfulness i don't know if you could identify everybody right uh, starting from uh, you know Hugh Jackman on the on the left and next is uh, you know he's a british actor you know leads a very demanding life and and that's why he, he looks to you know mindfulness to help him and of course uh, kim ryan you know he's a us congressman he's also written a book called uh, mindfulness nation and and next is uh, lebron james one of the leading basketball player he practices mindfulness to improve his focus and concentration um, on the field when he's playing basketball and the next is the us army and then you see the, um, the house of the british house of commons the british parliament right of course oprah being free so these are all you know people who currently and there are several others who practice mindfulness right so mindfulness is very popular right and 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 to the extent where if you look at the in the last two decades the amount of peer review papers and publications have increased so much right as i said it's a scientifically proven so there are a lot of journals uh, studies around that in terms of you know how effective mindfulness is right and similarly companies like uh, you know google and nike and, and and apple you know and several more you know uh, companies have uh, started in you know uh, implementing mindfulness practices inside the organization and google being the pioneer in it google started very very early right and these are some of the other companies you know uh, who are currently uh, uh, you know practicing or or having mindfulness practice for the employees so we'll talk about one of the case study as well as we go inside right so now i want to talk about what is mindfulness right so i'm, I'm again you know I'm, I'm making it very simple from a definition standpoint right it's about being fully aware of what is unfolding right and 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 john cabot sin who is the father of the modern day mindfulness talks about you know paying attention on purpose what are experiencing experience you're going through you know moment by moment without being judgmental being compassionate right so that is what we talk about mindfulness but then in a in a simple term mindfulness is all about being in the present moment being aware of what is unfolding right we call it as here and now right so that's what mindfulness from a definition standpoint all it means is right and, and we talk about roots of mindfulness it goes all the way up to 2500 years back uh, to buddhism right and of course the it, it originates from this pali world called sati right the modern day world today is called mindfulness right so we'll, we'll we'll learn a little more about mindfulness right so i want to quickly talk about what are some of the benefits of mindfulness we talked about in the first slide you know why invest in mindfulness right here i'm going to talk about benefits like it, it, it could happen to all of us right when we practice mindfulness and i as a practitioner myself i have seen some of these benefits you know personally over, over the last five years right so i'm going to talk about maybe two of these benefits here one is to do with your health and one to do with your cognition right so one is when we practice mindfulness right when i say practice the experience what you just did that's a practice right the two minutes what you did is a practice right when you do that on a consistent basis on a regular basis there are certain hormones which gets released in our body they help cut down our cardiovascular disease hypertension diabetes right all of this changes in our body right as i said these are all scientifically proven in a clinical non-clinical workplace setting all of that is tried and tested right on the cognition side right we talked about the prefrontal cortex which is responsible for your focus concentration creativity thinking right memory mental clarity right so when you practice mindfulness the access to prefrontal cortex is a lot better the part of the brain which is prefrontal cortex lights up a lot more so you're able to access your prefrontal cortex even in a stressful situation so that you can make better decisions you can you can probably be you know what i would say is you know you could you could respond to things then react to things in life right today most of the time we react right so you learn to respond as we practice mindfulness so these are some of the benefits i want to highlight right and here's the case study we talked about the case study right so so sap as as a company offers mindfulness program to all their employees right so the case study where 650 employees participated in the program and they continue to practice so the key here is continuing to practice mindfulness right so as you said as you see all of them were assessed up to four weeks and six months, right? The level of happiness and well-being went up. The meaning and satisfaction went up. Their ability to focus went up. The level of mental clarity and creativity went up. And of course, on the right-hand side, you've also noticed 
their stress levels went down right so this is what mindfulness can do when you practice right and that's the reason it is now available in schools and colleges everywhere you know mindfulness is available and in the respect of any age all of us can practice mindfulness right and the other thing very important to understand uh, mindfulness especially for our corporate folks right a we do a couple of things one is we we, we multitask a lot in fact you know i'm i'm an hr professional myself and back in the days when i used to you know run my team you know one of the biggest skill i thought i had was multitasking and i used to hire candidates based on those i i i used to look for people who could multitask later when i started my mindfulness practice then i realized multitasking is a myth it actually cuts down your productivity by 40% or 30% you tend to make more mistakes when you multitask because your brain can focus only on one item at a time if you start doing two or three your brain is dividing the attention to all the tasks and that's why you lose productivity you make mistakes right so mindfulness basically you know will teach you the process of how to not multitask right you're only because you're only trying to focus on one thing at a time right as a practice of mindfulness that is what you learn and you stop multitasking as a ongoing habit right and the next one is autopilot we all go on autopilot mode all the time right from the time we wake up and till the time we go to bed there are things which we do on autopilot mode starting from brushing to showering to eating our meal driving a car sitting in meetings working on a desk half the time we are not even present we are somewhere else everything is happening on autopilot mode right mindfulness as a practice will reduce the autopilot mode and and make sure that you are aware in every small aspect of whatever you do whether it is brushing your teeth or showering or eating a meal or driving your car or sitting in a meeting doesn't matter you'll be present in all these aspects that's what you'll realize when you start practicing mindfulness because you will notice your mind does wander while we are doing this session i'm sure how many times your mind has wandered you've gone somewhere and then after a few seconds you come back here there's a thought triggering the mind is producing a thought there is a noise some distraction is there right that's what happens during our autopilot mode as well right so mindfulness will help you to reduce your autopilot mode and be present more and more in any mundane task you do doesn't matter right so that's what you learn when you practice mindfulness right so there's a small exercise uh, you know i'm going to quickly check time uh, okay maybe maybe we can do this right so this is another exercise you know uh, which is very popular and then the, the acronym itself says stop right uh, which basically means stop and take stock take a breath so so i'm going to i'm going to walk you through this so so you may you want to experience you know uh, one more exercise along with me right so this is a simple practice that you can you know actually sprinkle throughout your day you know to help break out of your autopilot and ground yourself you know at the present moment and, and maybe shift your attention to what is really in, you know what you really intend to you know or maybe focus in that particular moment or or maybe what is most important to you right um as 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 you know your your day goes on right so that is what we are going to do right so 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 let's get started right as i said the acronym is stop and it stands for you know stop stand for take a breath uh, so so you are you are steadying your mind and your breath observing basically observing your body observing your feelings and emotions and observing how your your mind is if it's busy or calm and then and then finally proceeding you know to what most important thing you need to do right so let's practice this for a moment and then um, we can go ahead and and you know uh, complete our presentation as well right so and and plus it is also available in the app which i'm going to give you as part of the takeaway here so you can also practice this later if you if you really like this right so i want again all of you to get into the same uh, posture what we talked about earlier right chin parallel to the ground both the feet back straight you know completely relaxed shoulders right take a moment to you know uh, get in the posture and and this particular posture of wakefulness is possible right i basically am trying you to be awake and and mindfulness is often called the practice of falling awake right and here we are with a sense of straight spine a sitting comfortable and relaxed posture I welcome you to close your eyes. You feel comfortable with that, 
or, or maybe you can gaze at something. Either way, it's fine. Take a few deep breaths, collecting your attention. So here we are. You can stop and we can become aware of this breath as it comes and goes out. Just become aware of your breathing in this moment. And take a moment to notice where you feel the breath most prominent in the body. Is it the tip of the nose or, or your chest or, or your belly? Just being aware of breathing and just taking this practice one breath at a time, allowing yourself to use the breath as an anchor into the moment. Now, as we are breathing, we can become more aware of this body, noticing the, the position of the body, if there's any tension or any tightness anywhere in the body. Maybe there's a sense of feeling loose. Not judging any of this, whether it is good or bad, right or wrong. You're just being aware as it is. Next. We can also focus our attention into our emotions. How are we feeling in this moment? Is there a sense of frustration or irritation or maybe bored or feeling excitement or joy? Whatever is there again, not judging it, but just being aware of and letting it be. And the same respect, we can bring our attention to our minds and noticing our thoughts for a moment, noticing if the mind is busy or it's calm or it feels cloudy or clear. And now with the awareness, with this breaking of autopilot and grounding to this moment, we can ask ourselves, what's the most important thing right now? What are we intending to do right now in the next moment? What are we wanting to do in the next moment? And the, as the answer arises, I want all of you to open your eyes. Right. So that is a, a simple stop exercise. It's, it's probably runs around two minutes in our uh, two, two and a half minutes in our app, right? We could all practice during several times when we start feeling overwhelmed and we need the break, right? So that season, you know, we use this exercise as acronym as stop, right? So this is another exercise I want to give you a small, you know, preview of that. So that's the, the stop exercise, right? So how do you practice mindfulness, right? So today we talked about, you know, the, the whole concept of mindfulness. How does it benefit you, you know? And then you also experience mindfulness. So how do we practice, right? So as a beginner, we all need, you know, help, right? Somebody to coach you, right? And, and of course, finding a mindfulness coach to work with you on one-on-one -on -one basis is going to be very tough, right? So that's the reason we have introduced this app called Tranquil Mindfulness app and, and all of the you know, participants they can download this app from the Google Play Store or iOS App Store, right? And, and you can go to the guided section, you register yourself, you can go to the guided section and you can listen to all the tracks available, right? And you can start practicing mindfulness, right? And, and the beauty of mindfulness practices in, in, in eight weeks time, right? You'll start realizing that Mindfulness is just a, not a practice, but then it's a way of life, right? You are mindful, you are present in every aspect of your life, whatever you're doing, wherever you are, right? That is what you'll realize, right? Eight to 10 minutes or eight weeks can bring that change, you know? Huge change, I would say, right? So it's that's what you will learn, experience when you start practicing mindfulness, right? The next is when you go to the guided section, you'll see a lot of these tracks are locked, Right, so we call it the premium content, and, and not everybody has access to it. So for all the participants today to unlock the premium content, the code is premium in capital letters. So remember, uh, premium in capital letters is what you need to use to unlock the content. Okay, all right. So next, let's talk about a little bit about you know as an HR leader, right? What can you do, right? I'm sure we all have challenges today, you know, which is very different than what we have seen in the past, right? Not that. Uh, you know, earlier was any better, of course, you know, this particular role, as I have I've been here more than two decades in this role, I understand, you know, uh, there is constant challenge, you know, every day is different challenges, nothing changes, you just don't have a sigh of relief at any point of time, right? So, 
So one of the you know several things you know like which I where I talk about right in terms of as as a as a compassionate mindful HR leaders right one is showing empathy and being available right understanding you know what what is you know uh, your employees are likely going to be feeling very overwhelmed around this time right being very anxious right related to the whole pandemic or lockdown what do you want to call it right make yourself available to your staff right talk about their fears right answer any question and reassure them that you know whether it is work or anything else right you're always there and you're always available for them right and staying connected is very important right and today i'm sure you know luckily we have great tools available for us to stay connected including this particular tool what we're using today for this webinar right with whether ms teams or zoom or, or go to meeting or whatever it is there are several tools for us to stay connected so it's very important you know staying connected with our team our, our you know our colleagues and co-workers right and of course recognizing the impact of isolation loneliness a lot of us today are working in a place where you don't have anybody else right so so working remotely can cause people to feel isolated whether within the family or alone or or by yourself obviously there are a lot of challenges right so so addressing acknowledging that is going to be very very important right and of course you know a lot of people uh, uh, you know sought to you know online training because a lot of hand time in hand for a lot of them so that is very important as an hr we could always you know increase that and and trusting your employees to be productive is very important right a lot of us today have this trust issues in terms of you know i'm, I'm not able to you know be around my team i don't know how productive they are whether they're really working right so trusting them and, and coaching your you know managers to trust your employees is very very important of course there are a lot of strategies we can adopt around it in terms of how do we work with your team so that you're also, you know, it's very transparent of what they're doing and then you can check and, you know, there's balance and all of these things. And asking for help as, as an HR professional, right? We also, self-care is very important, right? We can't pour from an empty cup. It's very important that we, we take care of ourselves, right? So that is something very, very important, right? Virtual break for all of us while we're doing this online, you know, work, you know, our, our workload is probably, you know, increased at least by 30, 40%, right? Virtual breaks are very important to stay connected with the team members, right? And of course, finally, as, as, a, as a HR professional, it's very important that, you know, we need to show that we all care for them, right? And and finally, you know, when we talk about leadership and mindfulness, right? Um, I, I want to talk about, you know, uh, you know, currently we are, as I said, you know, an, an unprecedented pressure to be productive and, and, and to be available around the clock, right? And, and this can lead to a, you know, a working environment which is fragmented by distractions or or, or non-stopping or non-ending demands right and of course you know it, it, it's going to you know know how where it's going to lead a lot of stress and burnout right so so mindfulness is you know known to you know help you know in the leadership area as well right so so one of the most important thing you know is self-awareness right in a, in, a, in a volatile uncertain you know, maybe a complex and ambiguous world, it is very essential that that we all remain aware of our own emotional state, right? And and how are you coming across to others is very important, right? I'm sure you've, you've heard about emotional intelligence, EQ, and all of that, right? That's exactly what I'm talking about. The self-awareness, you know, facilitated by mindfulness. We talked about being aware as one of the core, you know, practice of mindfulness, right? Can benefit you as a leader in number of ways. Right? Being alert, you know, to your own behavior is key in, in, in ensuring that, you know, you are the leader you want and need to be all times, right? Most of us have a concept of ideal self, the leader we would like to be, and the behaviors we would, you know, allow us to reach to these goals or to the ideal self. But how many times have you have an accurate idea of how close we are to this, right? And, and, and the only way you can achieve is being aware. Right, so that's the reason the self-awareness is very, very important. We talked about being in the present moment, right? So, so the 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 modern-day leader, you know, needs to be able to experience situations clearly and without, you know, being, you know, uh, prejudiced or or or, you know, got caught up in an emotional baggage, right? So, so mindfulness is, is the key to maintaining those unbiased focus, right? Being in the moment, right? And, and people who multitask often spend much time. You know, uh, thinking about things they need to do next, or things they have to worry about, right? Or, or issue which is going to come up, right? So, so mindfulness as a practice, you know, will will help you temporarily forget all about that, right? And and help you think about, you know, being here and now, which is what the present moment, right? And of course, compassion is very important, 
right? And and then in fact, I, I talk about self compassion a lot, right? So compassion is all about you know how you know you are able to show you know the concern, love, and empathy to yourself, right? And and, and self compassion is redirecting all those things to yourself. Right, and today we are able to show compassion to a lot of us, but then we are not compassionate to ourselves. We are probably very hard on ourselves. Right, the negative self-talk happening. You are not good for this. You don't deserve this. All that conversation which happens inside our head. Right, so that is in practicing self-compassion, which is the part of mindfulness, is very very important. Where you are, you are, you are, you are, you know, you treat yourself the way you treat your friends or a family member. Being nice to them, right? That is what we talk about in compassion, right? Building resilience, right? This is probably one of the, you know, the latest fad we talk about. Right? In fact, we do a lot of workshops around resilience, right? Your ability to withstand major trauma or tragedy, right? Quickly bounce back from setbacks, cope with pressure without being stressed, right? So all of that is something you know a leader should have these qualities, right? And mindfulness inculcates and develops this. Whole resilience building, right? We all are born resilient to some extent, but then you can learn and develop to be more resilient, right? So that is something you learn, right? And finally, we talked about decision making, right? The whole prefrontal cortex, right? And, and all the powerful leaders, great leaders, are are well considered, you know, as as rational decision makers, right? But but however, you know, the high amount of pressure we deal with can actually, you know, provoke. An irrational behavior or irrational decision making to most of these leaders today, making them very ineffective. Right? So it's very important that you know you 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 look at the the whole rational decision making and and you know all of that is something as as part of mindfulness practice can make you an effective leader. So, so these are some of the points I want to talk about as part of you know uh, given the leadership community I'm, I'm addressing. Right? And final takeaway is you know today we do not treat physical health and mental health in the same terms. Right? So that is one of the you know ask from my side is you know as leaders we all need to understand right physical health and mental health are are no different right we should start treating them in the same breath right in fact I, I remember uh, a dinner in, in one of my friends' place of course long time back before the COVID nineteen and and he has two daughters one is five or six another one is probably eight or nine right while we were at their home for dinner the elder one while playing fell right immediately. I could see a you know a bruise in her knee. I, you know she reached out to a bandaid and then and then she put it on the wound. She knows that I need to take care of the wound. If I left unattended, it could you know cause you know bacteria, whatever it is, right? And similarly, you know the younger one or, or both these girls around the time of seven seven thirty, I, I could hear my friend telling them, hey, listen, you know go brush your teeth and go to bed, right? So we pay so much attention to our our dental hygiene, our physical hygiene. But then, when was the last time we asked ourselves or our our loved ones, right? Is there an emotional hygiene in place for us, right? So it's very important we start treating, right? We give a lot of attention to physical health. I'm not seeing anything wrong with that. But then, can we start doing some of that part for emotional hygiene as well, right? Checking with everybody, how are they doing? Is there anything we can do for them, help them, right? And of course, you know, I'm, I'm sure uh, you know you might have access to EAP. You know, all of that is something you can use right so all right so that's the final poll um you know i'm going to open that and and any questions um you know we can we can answer those questions as well so again the same poll you can go to menti.com and uh and you could use the same code 2395 is a code and you could uh, you know i want to hear from you what are some of the takeaways uh, as part of this uh, webcast okay um any questions Shashi, you had emailed me a few so questions earlier. Yeah, all of you have been unmuted. You can just unmute from your uh, GoToWebinar app and uh, ask any question if you have any. So one of the questions I generally get is about you know, is um, mindfulness similar to any of this meditation or or the the pranamyas we do, right? Uh, so, so the uh, my my answer to them is the the the, the pranayama as part of yoga or meditation is a technique which involves 
you know various ways to control your your breathing as it and use extensively and, and you know various yoga and asanas right um and and meditation to that extent is more structured formal seated practice sometimes involves you know religion as well right you know you are you have to uh sit in a certain asana or or recite uh you know hold certain mudras or recite certain mantras all of that is possible then mindfulness on the other hand is completely secular practice as i said it's scientifically proven and and you could be uh, sitting down on on the floor or on the chair or lying down or you could be practicing anywhere while while eating i could be in, you know practicing mindfulness of being present right basically trying to enjoy what am i eating what is the you know ingredients gone into this food right so all of this is something i can enjoy so so mindfulness when i talk about meditation or other things they are a very structured practice and they have a time and place to do it but mindfulness is the way you live it could become part of your life and you will completely you know live a, a mindful life so it applies to every aspect of whatever you do right so that is what you will experience when you practice mindfulness any any other questions great so uh, thank you so much uh, sarvanan it was a very useful and insightful information for everybody on the uh, on the uh, attended the uh, workshop especially in the current times when uh, covid is taking um, is is hitting every everybody on both on a professional and on a personal front as well so uh, if there are any questions we'll wait for a minute more and then we can otherwise we can discuss sure thank you very much Awesome. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for attending and uh, looking forward to connecting with you guys with other informational uh, events like this in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you.